Friends and travelers, however you've arrived, I bid you welcome. Here at Let's Be Frank, we're about lives, and above all, living well. I don't expect a podcast hosted by Benjamin Franklin could be about anything else. In my lifetime, I pursued the practice of moral improvement like a science, recording my successes and, yes, oftentimes reveling in my failings. It's my hope with our weekly almanac to give to a curious world delicious morsels of history in quick, easy-to-digest installments. Perfect for a sit in your favorite chair or a morning walk to work. At the end of each installment, I like to wrap it all up in a neat little lesson that you can apply to your own life, inspired by the events, stories, and personalities shared in each episode. So sit back, relax, and together... Let's make history. Greetings and salutations, dear listener. Welcome to another installment of Let's Be Frank, an auditory almanac for the curious mind with me, your faithful friend and host, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, printer. Thanks for stopping by today, my dear Junto. If you wish to get to know us better, check us out at Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at BFranklinLive. If you like the show, it would mean a great deal to me if you liked it and left a review to make it easier for others to find us. And if you love the wit and wisdom of Benjamin Franklin in the 21st century, consider joining our Patreon to support the history we try to make every day. You can find the link in our show notes. We have just one more episode to go before our thrilling season finale, so let's dig right into it. For purposes of good order, this podcast is composed of several primary sources associated with Ben Franklin's life, knit together to collect it all into one narrative on a cohesive theme. Today's episode is the fourth and final installment of this season's main focus, the winding road that brings us to this upcoming Saturday, the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. Today, we fill in all the pieces that set the table for our little party so that, with our finale, we can take this carefully laid table and make an absolute mess of it. Trouble continues to brew in the American colonies, And my friends, we have a front row seat. So sit back, relax, and let's get ready to spill. Spilling Tea, Part 1, had us talking about the colony's reaction to the Stamp Act, with accounts from Richard Bland, John Dickinson, and yours truly. In Part 2, we explored the riots in response to the Stamp Act, all the way to the Boston Massacre. Part 3, we heard from John Hancock, the defense of Mr. John Adams, of the soldiers involved in the 1770 massacre. So, my friends, the question is, where do we start now? Well, dear listener, we've talked about the Stamp Act, debated the legality of it, and explored the inconvenience of the Townsend Revenue Acts. So how did the tea become center stage in the midst of this baleful and politically fraught pageantry? Well, The Townsend Revenue Acts, which placed duties upon paper, lead, glass, paint, and tea, would eventually be repealed, except for the duty on tea. Parliament would double down upon these duties in May of 1773 with the passing of the Tea Act. Now, while the Stamp Act was put forward under the auspice of making the colonies pay their fair share for the French and Indian War, the Tea Act had a less honorable motivation— It existed solely to prop up a company that by 1773 was deemed too big to fail. I'm speaking, of course, of the East India Company. It was worth mentioning that several major investors and shareholders of that company happened to be members of Parliament. The Tea Act, passed on the 20th of May of 1773, set the East India Company up as a monopoly in the American colonies, lowering the duties on imported teas, and while lowering the cost of tea, further curtailing the economic choice and autonomy amongst the American merchants. Now, the purpose of the Tea Act was twofold. One, to save the near bankrupt British Import Company by granting it a virtual monopoly of the American tea market, and two, 
and this is the troublesome bit, to assert British authority to tax the American colonies. The act reduced the duty on British tea, but for decades American merchants had avoided paying any tax on tea by smuggling lower-priced tea from French and Dutch suppliers and bribing British officials to look the other way. So here we see uh, yet more evidence, my dear friends. The American Revolution was not pursuing anything different, but rather the autonomy and independency that the colonists had always enjoyed. We wrapped it up in pretty ideals, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in 1773, as we walk the narrow road to our tea party, a great many of the American colonists simply had their minds upon their pocketbooks. Our first primary source for the day comes from one David Ramsey, who offers a brilliant summary of this particular epoch in his History of the American Revolution, 1789. Here is what Ramsey has to say. For ten years, 1764 to 1773, there had now been but little intermission to the disputes between Great Britain and her colonies. Their respective claims had never been compromised on middle ground. The calm which followed the repeal of the Stamp Act was, in a few months, disturbed by the Revenue Act of the year 1767, one of the Townsend Acts. The tranquility which followed the repeal of the five-sixth of that Act in the year 1770 was nothing more than a truce. The reservation of the duty on tea, made as an avowed evidence of the claims of Great Britain to tax her colonies, kept alive the jealousy of the colonists, while at the same time the stationing of a standing army in Massachusetts, the continuance of a board of commissioners in Boston, the constituting the governors and judges of that province independent of the people, were constant sources of irritation. The altercations, which at this period were common between the royal governors and the provincial assemblies, together with numerous vindications of the claims of America, made the subject familiar to the colonists. The ground of the controversy was canvassed in every company. The more the Americans read, reasoned, and conversed on the subject, the more were they convinced of their right to the exclusive disposal of their property. This was followed by a determination to resist all encroachments on that palladium of British liberty. They were as strongly convinced of their right to refuse and resist parliamentary taxation as the ruling powers of Great Britain were of their right to demand and enforce their submission to it. The claims of the two countries being thus irreconcilably opposed to each other, the partial calm which followed the concession of Parliament in 1770, was liable to disturbance from every incident. Under such circumstances, nothing less than the most guarded conduct on both sides could prevent a renewal of the controversy. Instead of following those prudential measures, which would have kept the ground of the dispute out of sight, an impolitic scheme was concerted between the British Ministry and the East India Company, which placed the claims of Great Britain and her colonies in hostile array against each other. In the year 1773 commenced a new era of the American controversy. To understand this in its origin, it is necessary to recur to the period when the solitary duty on tea was accepted from the partial repeal of the Revenue Act of 1767, when the duties which had been laid on glass, paper, and painter's colors were taken off, a respectable minority in Parliament contended that the duty on tea should also be removed. To this it was replied that as the Americans denied the legality of taxing them, a total repeal would be a virtual acquiescence in their claims, and that in order to preserve the rights of the mother country, it was necessary to retain the preamble and at least one of the taxed articles. It was answered that a partial repeal would be a source of endless discontent and that the tax on tea would not defray the expenses of collecting it. The motion in favor of a total repeal was thrown out by a great majority. The expected revenue from tea failed in consequence of the American Association to import none on which a duty was charged. This, though partially violated in some of the colonies, was well observed in others, and particularly in Pennsylvania, where the duty was never paid on more than one chest of that commodity. 
This proceeded as much from the spirit of gain as of patriotism. The merchants found means of supplying their countrymen with tea smuggled from countries to which the power of Britain did not extend. They doubtless conceived themselves to be supporting the rights of their country by refusing to purchase tea from Britain, but they also reflected that if they could bring the same commodity to market, free of duty, their profits would be proportionately greater. The cry of endangered liberty once more excited an alarm from New Hampshire to Georgia. Though the opposition originated in the selfishness of the merchants, it did not end there. The great body of the people, from principles of the purest patriotism, were brought over to second their wishes. They considered the whole scheme as calculated to seduce them into an acquiescence with the views of Parliament for raising an American revenue. Much pains were taken to enlighten the colonists on this subject, and to convince them of the imminent hazard to which their liberties were exposed. The provincial patriots insisted largely on the persevering determination of the parent state to establish her claim of taxation by compelling the sale of tea in the colonies against the solemn resolution and declared sense of the inhabitants, and that at a time when the commercial intercourse of the two countries was renewed and their ancient harmony fast returning, the proposed vendors of the tea were represented as revenue officers employed in the collection of an unconstitutional tax imposed by Great Britain. The colonists reasoned with themselves that, as the duty and the price of the commodity were inseparably blended, if the tea was sold, every purchaser would pay a tax imposed by the British Parliament as part of the purchase money. To obviate this evil and to present the liberties of a great country from being sacrificed by inconsiderate purchasers, sundry town meetings were held in the capitals of the different provinces, and combinations were formed to obstruct the sale of the tea sent by the East India Company. As the time approached when the arrival of the tea ships might be soon expected, such measures were adopted as seemed most likely to prevent the landing of their cargoes. The tea consignees, appointed by the East India Company, were in several places compelled to relinquish their appointments, and no others could be found hardy enough to act in their stead. The pilots in the River Delaware were warned not to conduct any of the tea ships into their harbor in New York. Popular vengeance was denounced against all who would contribute in any measure to forward the views of the East India Company. The captains of the New York and Philadelphia ships, being apprised of the resolutions of the people, and fearing the consequence of landing a commodity charged with an odious duty in violation of their declared public sentiments, concluded to return directly to Great Britain without making any entry at the customs house. It was otherwise in Massachusetts. So here we are, my friends, the autumn of 17 and 73. News of this hated tea act is here in the colonies. Capital cities host meetings to determine what are we to do with this tea coming into the colonies. While Philadelphia and New York have made decisions, the people of Boston endeavor to determine what course of action will lead to the restoration of their liberties. Our next sources for today's installment come from various Boston newspapers through November of 1773 all the way to where we are now. The first, the Massachusetts Spy, or Thomas's Boston Journal, the 4th of November, 1773. Yesterday, there was a numerous assembly of the inhabitants of this and the neighboring towns at Liberty Tree, agreeable to a notification that had been the day before issued to hear the persons to whom the tea shipped by the East India Company is consigned make a public resignation of their office as consignees upon oath, and also swear that they will reship any tea that may be consigned to them by said company by the first vessel sailing for London. The assembly, having waited till twelve o'clock, the time set for the merchants to meet the assembly, then appointed a committee of respectable inhabitants of this town to wait on Mr. Richard Clark, and son, the two Messrs. Hutchinsons and Mr. Fenuel, reported to be the consignees, who were together at Mr. Clark's store, and acquaint them that as they had neglected to attend, they should think themselves warranted in looking upon them as the enemies of the people, and having read the message to them, were answered that they should pay no regard to it, which the people, who were waiting in the street, being informed of by the committee, they were returning back to Liberty Tree, there to consult what steps were proper further to be taken. 
but some of them, being irritated with the haughty manner with which the answer was said to be given, turned back and showed some marks of their resentment, then dispersed. The next, from the 18th of November, the Boston Newsletter. Last evening, a number of persons assembled in School Street. They broke the windows and did other considerable damage by throwing large stones into the house of the late Middlecott Cook Esquire, near King's Chapel, now belonging to Dr. Sultan Stoll of Haverhill and occupied by Richard Clark Esquire, one of the seven Boston merchants assigned by the East India Company to sell its imported tea. The next, the 2nd of December, 1773, the Massachusetts spy. Last Saturday arrived Captain Clark in a brig from London, which he left the latter end of August. And yesterday morning, Captain Hall in the ship Dartmouth came to an anchor near the castle in about eight weeks from the same place on board of whom it is said are 114 chests of the so much detested East India Company's tea, the expected arrival of which pernicious article has for some time passed has for some time past put all these northern colonies in a very great ferment. In this morning the following notification was posted up in all parts of the town. Friends, brethren, countrymen, that worst of plagues, the detested tea shipped for this port by the East India Company, is now arrived in this harbor, the hour of destruction or manly opposition to the machinations of tyranny stares you in the face. Every friend to his country, to himself and posterity, is now called upon to meet at Fanwell Hall at nine o'clock this day, at which time the bells will ring to make a united and successful resistance to this last, worst, and most destructive measure of administration. Ships lay idle in Boston Harbor, their bellies full of tea. To be offloaded would make a powerful statement to the acquiescence of British authority and obedience. With the eyes of the other colonies all upon the people of Boston, and meetings set for the next several days, what will the citizens of Boston do? And what action shall they soon take into their hands? The 250th anniversary of that decision will take place this Saturday, and we shall see the finale of our second season as we explore together that famous evening on the 16th of December. Stay tuned, dear listener, for our season two finale on the 250th, releasing this Saturday. That's all for today's installment. With that, we had more hours in the day, but as always, we have nothing but time between us. Resource materials and images from this week's episode can be found in the journal section of bfranklinlive.com. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok at bfranklinlive, and Let's Be Frank, an auditory almanac for the curious mind on Facebook. Love the wit and wisdom of Let's Be Frank, Consider supporting our Junto by joining our Patreon today. You can find the link to it in today's show notes. And, dear listener, spread the word. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your horse, I don't care. Let's make our intellectual Junto grow. And now, dear listener, our time together must come to an end. Fare thee well. And always remember, when you're good to others, you're best to yourself. Until we meet again, I remain your humble and obedient servant, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, printer. Stay curious, my friends. <laughs>